Hello everyone, and welcome again to another Teacher Joseph podcast. Today I want to explain what a lollipop lady is. Have you heard the term lollipop before? Well, that's the candy that some kids eat. It's a little stick, and it has a big circle of candy at the end of it. Well, a lollipop lady is a woman who usually stands near the school. She's authorised by the government to help kids cross the road safely. She usually wears a long white coat and she carries with her a huge stick with a big circle on the top which says the word STOP. That's why we call her the lollipop lady, because of the shape of the stick. Now, lollipop ladies are in decline. The government is making plans to get rid of them. After all, we have automated traffic lights now and pedestrian crossings. We also have zebra crossings. So there's no real need to have a woman to help kids cross the streets. The government has tried to get rid of them a few times, but these women are usually very strong and have very strong opinions about children as well. As a direct result of that, it's not easy to shift them. Lollipop ladies are culturally very, very British. They are icons of our society. And they're usually large ladies who are very concerned about the children. You don't often find them in other places except near schools, but they do sometimes turn up in children play areas and also at the weekends when children are perhaps doing some extra school activities or even downtown. Whenever there's children congregating, you usually find a lollipop lady outside a sweet shop perhaps, near a school or a play park. They're easily noticeable with these long white coats and fluorescent jackets with little hats as well. They kind of remind me of traffic wardens, but perhaps not quite so unpopular. Yesterday, I was walking in my street when I came across a lollipop lady. She smiled at me, and in a very deep voice, she said, Do you want to cross the road? For a moment, I actually thought it was the butcher, because she also is a very large lady who wears a long white coat. But I realized very quickly that it was the lollipop lady. I said yes. She marched to the middle of the road, and she stopped the traffic with her stick using one hand, And for the traffic which was coming in the opposite direction, she held her hand up to tell it to stop. I think the drivers were a little bit surprised when they saw a middle-aged man crossing the road, because lollipop ladies are really only there to help children. Although I also was quite surprised that she actually offered Anyway, once I got to the other side of the road, we had a chat because I realized that I knew who she was. Her son is a friend of mine who is a polyglot. Now, I hadn't spoken to him for ages, so I took the opportunity to ask how he is and also to get his up-to-date telephone number so I could call him. And so I did. Later in the day, I called my polyglot friend. 
Now, what was very interesting about our conversation is that my polyglot friend was telling me about some of the myths that exist about polyglots, and I wanted to share them with you. So basically, first of all, to let you understand, my polyglot friend speaks 10 languages, but he works in a local factory. He's a blue-collar worker. He doesn't consider himself to be highly educated, and he doesn't consider himself to be very special. We laughed when I said to him that uh, I thought he was quite amazing, speaking 10 languages. But his reply was very interesting. He said, the only difference between you and I is that I watch more TV than you do. He told me that, like most polyglots, he learns his languages purely from media and that there was no trick or memory feat associated with it. I joked with him that polyglots are always very rich and jetting off to other countries. And he very quickly pointed out that he hasn't been outside of the UK for the last 10 years. So, I mentioned about his memory. Surely he must have a great memory then to be speaking 10 languages. After all, he is very well known around here. And because I know him personally, I do know that he can speak 10 languages. Again, he joked and he said, no, it's nothing special. I said, well, how do you get to speak 10 languages when most of us struggle to learn even a second one? And that's when he started to tell me his story. So, first of all, he told me that it's all about passion. And passion really is something which drives him. He didn't set out to be a polyglot. He told me that he simply loved basketball. That was his thing, his passion in life. He considered himself a failure at school because he hated English and he really hated languages. Yet basketball was his thing. Not only did he play basketball, but he loved it. He said his love of languages came when he first started watching Japanese basketball. His parents had a very special satellite system or cable TV system before the internet came, and he was able to watch basketball from Japan. Very quickly, he found that in watching basketball more or less 24-7, because he wasn't working at the time, he very quickly was able to pick up different sounds. Then one day in our town, Apparently, he met a Japanese tourist, and she was struggling with English, and she wanted to know where the train station was. And he found, just naturally, he was able to give her directions in Japanese. And that's when he realized that he was able to speak bits of the language. He expanded a little bit and started watching dramas. And very quickly, very soon, he was speaking fluent Japanese. He was quick to assure me there was no studying. There were no books. He only simply watched media. But not only watched it, but he had a passion for it. Because he kept going back again and again to those wonderful sports matches. That's how he became fluent. Now, he said something very interesting in our telephone call. He said that most polyglots 
don't or cannot write in a second language. They only speak. Their trick is talking. They simply watch media pick up phrases until they become fluent. So I asked him, I said, are you telling me that you learned all these languages purely by watching TV? And he said again, the only difference between you and I is I watch more media. He said, look at me. I'm not a professional person. I don't like writing in English. And I certainly don't like writing in any second language. I can't. And I said to him, yeah, but there's a stereotype that polyglots are all government diplomats in these things. And he laughed and he said, no. And how can we possibly get a second job if we are only speaking in a language? How are we supposed to use that professionally if we can't even write? He then said, you know, even though I know Japanese colloquially and I can speak it almost like a native, if you ask me to do an exam, probably I wouldn't get a high mark because I'm not good with exams, even though I'm like a native speaker. He said he laughs when people see him as some kind of amazing person. And he said again, the only difference between me and anyone else is that I watch more TV. We spoke about polyglots and other ways of learning for a while. And he was very quick to say, look, really, if you want to speak a second language, you just have to watch and speak. You'll very soon learn it. But if it comes to exams and writing, well, that's a very different thing. It's a very long, slow and arduous process. He told me about his experiences at school where he hated learning languages. He said, you just have to put your passion along with what you like. And in my case, watching TV and sports brought me a second language. And when I was aware of that, I thought I would try some other sports in other languages. And very soon he found himself watching world TV in all kinds of languages, and he ended up completely fluent. So we debunked some myths. The first myth is that polyglots are all very professional and very rich. The second one is that all polyglots have amazing memories. I mean, he doesn't know what day of the week it is sometimes. And the third one, that they all have absolutely fantastic jobs, they're working for the government and they're traveling all the time. He said, none of those are true. But if you want to be a polyglot, just get your passion and your TV and put them together and look away from the traditional learning system. He said in his experience, the brain doesn't remember anything, but if you give it patterns and passion, it will do the work for you. I thought this was very, very interesting. So I just wanted to share that with you today. So that's it from me. We'll catch you all soon. See you. Bye.